The Pinball Network is online. Launching Pinball Party. Welcome to episode 22 of the Pinball Party Podcast. This is Jason, your slightly disheveled physically, just because I haven't taken a shower yet today, host. I'm going to talk to you about pinball today. So is someone else, I think. Me. Nah, meh, not you. Eat shit. How about you eat shit? You say that every time. I think it's your favorite thing to say. But I'll take the high horse. I don't want to neglect you, you know. Even though you're a robot, you seem to have feelings. I love you, Dad. Okay, don't get weird, man. I'm not your dad. Um, I, I had you made. I kind of, like, woke aside. I, I own you. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I mean, dude, you have two dads. Dad. No, I'm, again, idiot. I'm not your dad. But you have two of them. Maybe we'll introduce them to you at some point. But what I was saying before we made this really uncomfortable and weird, man. Dad. Don't call me dad. I was going to say, I, I don't want to neglect you. You know, you're you're a pinball guy. You know, you're clearly, there's all these games being announced right now. What uh, what game tickles your fancy? Foo Fighters. Nice, nice. Good call. Why is that? Because they rock my nuts off. Yeah, they rock my nuts off too. You know, I mean, I, I didn't mean to get all up on you about the whole dad thing. You know, I mean, we clearly are very similar. We have a lot of... Things in common, you know, you kind of like a chip off the old block, if you will, you know what I mean? Dad. Don't call me dad. Fuck you. All right, cool, good talk. We'll see you later. See ya. I actually want to address something um, that's near and dear to my, I don't know, heart or my, my pinball heart. My pinball, um, half the reason I'm doing this podcast, uh, I'll get to it in just a second before we do. Hey, we have a Patreon. Thanks for all the new members. Please go check it out. Forgive me who I haven't thanked. I'm actually recording this the day after the last episode. So this is going to be recorded in chunks because I just want to actually get to this email right away. And also Flippin' Out Pinball, sponsor of the show. They're the shit. I mean, what are we doing here? Why? Flippin' Out Pinball. F-L-I-P-N-O-U-T Pinball. Zach, Nicole, Greg, whole team. Fucking A. That's where I get my games. That's where I get my accessories. That's where I point other people because... I'm not an idiot, and I like to work with great companies. So, flipping out pinball. We slowed the jingle down last week, so let's pick it up. Okay. I got an email from a Joe who emailed in at pinballpartypodcast at gmail.com. First off, I enjoy listening to your podcast each week. I love your creativity and hearing from the electric bat. Thank you, Joe. However... If your most recent podcast, I have an issue with your take on Godfather. The issue isn't with the excitement, how it looks, or the overall impressions. The issue is when you said, quote, you don't care about the price, quote. It's easy to say you don't care about the price if you don't intend to purchase it, but you still should care about the price unless you don't even want to play it. That doesn't sound like the case. The price is so high for this game, two of our local operators have said they have no intention of buying Godfather. Hell, even your guest Kale from the Electric Bat said the same thing. So unless you're willing to travel to some elite operator location or have a rich friend that buys the game, most will not be able to play it. And that sucks. I'm also very excited about the game and I would love to play it. Like you, I have no intention to buy it, but would love to throw some money into play it, but it doesn't sound like a good option as well. So yeah, the price really is important and you should talk about it or don't. (laughs) It's your podcast. Love your show. Have a great day. And the reason I wanted to read that is because when I... I did say I don't care about the price last episode. And the reason I did is because I was trying to convince myself of that. For those who didn't listen to the first few episodes of this before it was on the Pinball Network, my very first episode was because I wanted to get a TNA. TNA 2.0 was released and announced, and it was $9,500. And I aptly said, get fucked. (laughs) That is way too high. What the hell are you doing? And that came from a place of exactly what he said. I want to play this game, but the prices are just getting nuts. Of course, every pinball manufacturer, every distributor, flip it out, you know, sponsored by him. Uh, it's all business. It's, it's here to make money. And I agree. Of course, th- that being said, 
prices are just getting nuts. So when I said I don't care about the uh, price of Godfather, I assure you, I really do. And I was just kind of telling myself that to, you know, when Bond 60th got announced, it was like, come on, what are we doing? Even when Toy Story 4, like, come on, what are we doing? TNA 2.0, what are we doing? The most aptly priced pinball machine at first glance, mind you, in the last, I would say, year, other than like a Stern Pro, is with Scooby-Doo to where you saw the price and like that thing, that thing looks like it's worth that. It looks loaded. And Godfather, to be honest, you know, the 15000 is too much for anything in pinball. But in the grand scheme of things, Godfather CE at 15000 looks way, way, way fucking more worth it than Bond 60th. It, it's not even close. If some objective onlooker from somewhere else saw a Bond, they'd, they'd be like, okay. And then they saw Godfather, whoa, hello, one of those is... Obviously, like ten thousand dollars more than the other. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and you're wrong, and it's the other way around. And the other reason I wanted to kind of talk about this price thing of, I started this podcast. Not that you care or you ask, but hey, this is why I'm talking. Whatever. Apparently, you apparently you listen to me. I don't know why you shouldn't. <laughs> I'm an idiot, but I started this thing because I've been in the hobby for I don't know five to seven years. A couple of those years were very softly, and then now buying and selling and all that. And I often got shit, and I still do sometimes, of, of how often I go through games. Man, what's wrong with you? You've got to bolt these things. Keep them forever. You're going to, quote, you're going to miss it. You know, those, those fucking figure it out. Figure it out. All right, there's a quick little figure it out. People who put in, quote, you're going to miss it on random, like, Facebook posts or whatever. Like, what's Shut up, dude. <laughs> Fuck you. What are you doing? How does that help anyone? You're going to miss it. Yeah, maybe. So, like, what, you keep things based on, at one point in my life, I might slightly miss it for a second, so I gotta hold on to this fucking thing, no matter what. Bolt that shit to, get a five-pound pike and bolt this fucker to the floor, because after that one time, I regret getting rid of this, holy shit, my life's over. I don't operate that way. Not not anything wrong with people that bolt stuff to the floor or all that there's, there's many different reasons to be into this hobby there's the collectors they want to just shine the machine get everything powder coated get the le of every model love it i like buying from you especially when it's a normal price because you guys keep care great care of your game and, and i totally love it there's others who want beaters that barely work and they're cheap as shit so they can put in the time and effort and then you know make a couple hundred bucks on it and feel good about it love it there's those that uh flip games constantly buy things at low just to sell it high those ones fucking unless you're bro bra because bro bra actually does it correctly and he's good and like the guy hey bro bra man you do it correctly but the other dumbasses that you know oh i know what i got this is the price and i don't pay attention to the market because i know what i'm talking about and you can also get fucked but for me i was always i want to play the game for a little bit and then i get bored with it and i move it on so why this all this price thing matters to me what a roundabout way of saying of this is literally what goes through my head when I, why I sell games so fast. I get shit still all the time, even from TPN people. I don't know why. Maybe they're not comfortable in their own skin. I don't know. Giving other people shit for flipping or not flipping games, but getting rid of games so fast. I don't know. It's just what I do. I get bored with things fast. You know, uh, video games. I, I do. I mean, not that it, I have like ADD, which some people say, oh, you have pinball ADD. Maybe to you, I guess. And that's really not. And believe me, I've been tested. <laughs> hey, here we go. Uh, hard on my sleeve. Full disclosure. Yeah, I've been tested. Uh, I'm on the borderline. I can control it. What I have really good, I'm really good at focusing on something that I want to put a 200% into. And sometimes that means I, I absorb things quickly. So I move on to something else. And to be honest, it's not from a lack of, of intelligence it's not from a lack of uh, attention. It's just how I work. So for me, games, I when I play them, either it's a game I like a lot and I, I keep it a long time. For me, a long time is honestly like a couple months. Or it's within a couple days. I'm like, okay, I can see where this is going. I'm not going to like this. So I list it for sale day one or whatever, just to either make my money back or lose a couple hundred or make a couple hundred. That's how I feel. So for me, the prices really, really matter. Because if I want to play a game... Again, to Joe's point, there's no Jersey Jack collection around me to play. I can drive a couple hours, sure, but you know, if I want to really... A Jersey Jack game, to be honest, is not a game to me that you can really absorb putting a couple quarters in on site and playing two games. Like, all right, I got my fill. You haven't even scratched the surface <laughs> of that game, guy. 
So for me as well, like I, I know what it takes to get into a game. You got to, I mean, newer, I should say. Maybe older games, not as much EMs, etc. But newer stuff, you need some time on it. So again, I, I buy a game. I usually have a collection of one to four. And I try to play as much as I can until I know like, okay, I'm done with it. But the price weighs heavily on me every time. The price is the number one thing. Because when I'm looking to buy or sell a game, I'm never, never, ever like, oh, how low can I get them so then I can sell it and make some money? No, never. That's what my day job is for. My day job is to make money. Pinball is just a hobby. So for those, again, out there who are doing this to make money, unless you're a distributor and doing it, fuck off. Just fuck off. Please, for me and everyone else, get fucked. Get fucked. Please stop doing that. I'll get a game, and if I feel like, let's say I get screwed in a deal, like I don't know about some super crazy wear or something that was was hidden from you or I didn't see or something, you know, get it home, and then that price, I feel it like, oh my God, I made a big mistake. Because it's thousands of dollars. It's it's a lot of money. This is not 10 bucks. And to be, I guess, even more clear, am I a millionaire? No, I'm, uh, I'm not going to tell you what I make. I'll give you a rough, you know, if, if, okay, here, here's what I do. I'm a senior manager of a technical sales team at a software company. So anyone who's roughly in that kind of field, now you have a general sense, give or take, you know, I work at a very competitive company. That's it. You know, so there, that's roughly what I make. Uh, I have a family, uh, one daughter, one wife, <laughs> uh, one beautiful, beautiful furry daughter named Mabel. And I like to save a lot. Uh, you know, I I max out my 401k every year. Okay, hey, so you know, this is not financial advice. I'm giving you my kind of perspective on price. This is where it comes from. I like to max out my 401k. Yeah, I have employer matching, but you know, I, I max mine out as much as I can. Uh, I save beyond that. I invest a little bit. Um, I have my own nest egg, right? For me, it's personally like a six month should me and my wife just get jammed. We have six months to just fucking live the way we're living right now for six months without change so we can find a job, all that. I have no debt aside from mortgage. There you go. I mean, I'm probably giving way too much away, but th- that's me. Um, I don't I don't keep credit card debt. I, uh, I have my mortgage and paid off my cars from when our, fuck it, when our company went public and there was an, whatever, there you go, right? So I get a, a good paycheck and, and, and I'm happy and, and I'm good and I can go on vacation once a year, you know, and do all that. So I, let's just say on average these days, on average is like $8,000 for a machine, you know, n- n- not something old. When you have a game in your house that's $8,000 and suddenly you're like, ooh, I don't love this thing. That $8,000 is suddenly like, that's sunken cost. That money's gone. Holy shit. You, and my, my wife trusts me and everything on the money and I, I but... That's still $8,000 on something that I might not even like. So it's in my house. I'm like, I don't like this thing. It's just this, uh, you know, I look at it as almost like as a debt just sitting there, an asset that's not being used. And that's what it is sometimes. I'm not because I'm not doing this for a business. But, you know, that's that's what weighs heavily on me is price. Just just being honest. That's why I go through games sometimes quickly of if it's an expensive thing. Suddenly I realize this thing is not worth $8,000 to me where I could. Let's see, $8,000 in a pinball machine that maybe I want to play once a week just in case, to that guy's point, I might, quote, miss it once for 10 seconds. 8000 bucks? It's not worth $8,000. So I list it, and I try and please get out of here because, oh, my God, now this thing, to me, it's like an anxiety kind of thing. Like, I don't want to have this. I, I, holy shit. Uh, $8,000 could be a vacation to Disney World for a week without having to, well, more than that, but you know what I mean, like where you could go and just do anything, do whatever you want pay for all the fast passes or lightning, whatever the fuck they call them now, buy steak dinners every night, just just who cares about money? There's that, a week of actual life experience, pick a vacation, or a pinball machine that once in a while I might, quote, miss it. So it's sitting there. That That's just not me. So that's what goes through my head. So when Joe reached out and the price, that it doesn't matter, there's a big diatribe on why, where the price very, very much matters to me, Joe. I'm, I'm very much in the same boat. I was just kind of practicing like let me try to not care about the price people talk about the bubble right now it's definitely a buyer's market uh it is definitely a buyer's market and um in a buyer's market these prices are even higher um 
So, uh, yeah, prices are near and dear to my heart. It's kind of why I started this. It's why I get so much shit from people about moving games in and out so fast. It's why I get, like, this anxiety of having machines in here, especially when I get the littlest inkling of not liking them. Oh, my God, fuck. So there's a there's a bunch of my word puke on why, Joe. I totally agree with you. I think prices are more than important, uh, not only just from a hobbyist, but from an operator. And if they just keep going up, there is a ceiling. I am, again, you know, I kind of talked about my financial practices. None of that is advice, mind you. But for me, there is a ceiling where I just like, you know, even if my wife trusts me and I know what I'm doing, like I, this just feels uncomfortable. and I just can't do this, you know. And I won't be someone that kind of softly gets out of the hobby. I've tried that. I can't. I either go full in on something, 5 million percent, or I'm out. So the point where this gets to be where I'm out yeah, I'll stop doing the podcast, I'll stop buying, I'll stop playing, I'll have to just like a Band-Aid, rip it off, stop going on Pinside, and just ignore it, and pinball's out of my life. That's the only way I can do it, because for a lot of those out there who know this kind of underlying thing as well, there's this slight addiction to buying and selling and the hunt, finding the games, and that thing drives me as well. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just like a lot of you, uh, I wake up, get my coffee and I start looking on Pinside or Facebook or searching and putting the price ranges in. I have my alerts, all that stuff that we do. I do it too. And sometimes I question, is this healthy? Uh, what am I doing? And is this healthy with this amount of money? I'm uh, again, like an $8,000 average. I'm playing with fire here. Uh, at what point do I just lose big time? And like, this is stupid where it's really just a game in the end. It's pinball. It's supposed to be fun. For me, I think the hunt is part of the game, and a lot of you, the collecting is part of the game, the fixing the machines is part of the game. It's fun from many angles, which is why I think in this small market, there is such an influx of creativity. There's podcasts, there's videos. If you look at the size of this hobby and the amount of media around a hobby this small, it's pretty wild. It's pretty impressive because I think of all the angles you can take from this, from art, sound, music, gameplay, design, coding, and I'm talking art on the playfield, outside, animation direction. There is a lot that goes into here. And, uh, you know, it's I'm thankful to be part of it, but I just know, like, if this ceiling gets to the point, prices get to a point, I'll be out, and I don't want that to happen. So thanks again, Joe, for writing in to the Pinball Party Podcast at gmail.com. Anyone out there, love to hear your thoughts. I would really love to go in-depth about a prime example of someone who needs to figure it out. But figure I'd out. probably be... It's not fair, because it's like private communication on Pinside, you know, to just... That's really... That would be really unfair of me, and just immoral, I think. So I'm not going to do that on this one. But <laughs> it's it's still the same people that think that a market is some static element that once something reaches a price... It stays there no matter what. Supply and demand be damned. I know what I have. Oh, I really would like to get into this. Um, I shouldn't. I really shouldn't. Let's just use this as an example, though. Someone has something listed at, I don't know, let's say it's $6,000, when it should be at most $5,000. Not because I'm some lord of Pinside that knows all the costs, but I do this a lot and a lot there's plenty of out there and i'm going to talk about someone soon who does have it figured out there's plenty out there that get what i'm saying you kind of have a pulse you know on anything like roughly two to five hundred dollars what something is at you see the market kind of go up you see it go down you hear pinball market trends you can i mean those of us who do it enough know this but there's those out there and where figure it out all began was kind of the rules of the road trips and the tricks what do you do in the secondary market but these people i like i, I i'm starting to not be able to handle it I'm sinking so low, <laughs> or maybe I guess maybe I'm rising up. Uh, the things that now I'm doing on Pinside when I message about games that are priced off. Now I've gotten to the point where I send these people links of previous sales to just say like, look, bro or bro et, um, these are the last five sales of the exact thing that you're asking to sell. And here's two that are currently available. Now we're looking at these numbers, which all start with a five and are in better condition and have more valuable mods and are home use only versus yours, who the only th only thing that yours has going for you 
is some stubborn ass on the other end that says, this is for sure worth six and I know it. Uh, th- that's cool if there's like a reason, like, uh, you know, does it have five color DMDs with it? Is it, you know, a pinball refinery or something that's actually kind of tangible? I say, quote unquote, worth value. No, your value is just your words and your one feedback. The last game you sold was in like 2018. You only sell like Johnny mnemonics that are in shit condition. And somehow you just, you have it figured out magically with this number so yeah i'm sending people links of it yeah like you know respectively here's literally what you're working with this is the market like i don't want to school you on how this works but like i'm trying because two things i want the game and i'm a very motivated buyer so like you can have thousands of dollars right now if you do this and i i'm like i swear i'm not burning you i'm like right in the middle of the market here's all the links like i'm like do you want money you know no i don't I'm holding up for that extra $300 because at one point could be three months from now. It could be six months from now. I'm going to by golly, get that $300. Good fucking luck. And I'm happy that you're going to maybe one day, most likely not get that money. In the meantime, I've probably bought and sold that game three times for a thousand dollars less than that. So you are now in competition with me. Who's pricing things aptly in the market clearly you don't have this figured out so eat some shit i almost feel bad for them Eh, but i don't i said almost and i mean that (laughs) i don't what i do is after this upsets me because their intelligence is so low i I stew about it and then i tell my wife i tell her this exactly what i told you way too in depth all this shit point is i need to be stopped (laughs) i need to be stopped maybe i'm the one that needs to figure it out In fact, I do. Dear Pinball slash Obsessed. Yes, you're listening. I hope you are. I, Jason, need to figure it out. Why? Because him and I made a deal on a Metallica Pro, and he went way above and beyond. He had a bunch of mods in his, and I was thinking of getting one, and the mods were like powder coats and things, you know, beyond color DMD that are kind of, you know, to, to me, take it or leave it. And I was like, hey... I'm interested, but a couple of these vanity um, mods I'm just not personally valuing. Would you mind taking some of them off and cutting some money? And he rightfully so hemmed and hawed a little bit and then got back to me. He's like, yeah, actually, I will. And he went, he bent over backwards for the price and everything. And we accepted a a price together. We committed. And I was like, cool, I'll be there Wednesday at, uh, you know, whatever, four o'clock, I think it was. And then the next day he sent me a follow up like, hey, just want to make sure you're good to go before I pack it up, you know. And I was like, uh, yeah, long story short, I'm not. Fuck. I, I backed out of the deal. I totally did. I totally did not have it figured out. I need to figure it out. Figure I apologized out. to him via text and on the Chicago forums. And I'm doing it out there to anyone listening. I've backed out of deals in the past. In fact, I just did it, you know, yesterday. And I'm really sorry. It happens to me all the time. I don't mean to propagate that behavior Ugh, it's just maybe the previous anxiety of money gives us all you know reasons it's not an excuse it's just a reason so pinball obsessed fantastic pin cider to work with i don't have it figured out he does also someone who i definitely want to call out as a figured out member of the pinball community pin side name balk boy it's b-l-a-b-a-l-k-e boy real name is blake somewhat local to me we did a deal on a uh, Black Knight Sword of Rage very recently. I think he listens to this podcast. So, hey, Blake. Hey, man. Um, he came over. We played some games. Actually, another uh, another local guy came over. We played uh, three-way, three-way TNA um, to see how far we could get. And we were embarrassingly terrible. Uh, I've gotten way farther than the three of us did together. In fact, uh, John, who came over, also has got in, in, him playing there. Right when me showing him the rules got farther than all three of us. So that, that game can be brutal as shit. But we had fun, uh, sold him a game. He clearly knows how the prices work, and it's just he knows the whole process. Helped me load it up. Help, he even helped me move it upstairs. Fucking A. Like, you know, like, let's not die. Get your back ready to really pull some muscles. I'll get it on the dolly. Uh, I'll go up the stairs backwards. You push it up. And it was a pleasure, man. Good times. Just to be clear, there is equal amount of good figured out people, if you will, out there. There's just so many shitbags. 
<laughs> but maybe that's just Earth. You know? Planet Earth. Welcome to Planet Earth, aliens from the Foo Fighters game and Galactic Tank Force. And what else is aliens? Uh, the Scott Denisi game. Welcome to Earth. A shitload of shitbags and a couple good gems. Gems that have only been forged from the constant berating from said shitbags. Anyway, Blake, you, my friend, have it figured out. Figured out. All right, and right before we get to the star of the show, listen to this shit. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. Ah, Pulp Fiction, shown, gameplay trailer, read the little synopsis here, Play Mechanics, Pinball, and Chicago Gaming Company are proud to introduce Quentin Tarantino's groundbreaking cinematic masterpiece, Pulp Fiction, to the world of pinball, a vintage-inspired experience designed by Mark Ritchie, Indiana Jones, The Pinball Adventures, and Fishtails fame, Pulp Fiction Pinball features original, hand-drawn cabinet and playful artwork, over 250 iconic lines of dialogue from 19 legendary characters, and five licensed songs from the film's classic soundtrack, Zed's Dead, Baby, Zed's Dead. Everyone out there, go check out the trailer. Pulp Fiction Pinball trailer, Google it, you'll find it. It looks really, really, (laughs) really sweet. The couple, you know, quick things to note, single level... I say that because it looks like there's like a, a ramp, kind of, into the uh, the briefcase, the golden briefcase, you know, that shines in their face and you never, never know what it is. Is that a ramp? It looks like it's like got a drop-down ramp into it. Anyways, all the scores are numeric. There does not look to be a screen per se, although the alphanumeric looks like it does text and numbers and probably maybe a little more than it did way back in the day. Inline drops, single level, but really cool magnets, uh, a gobble hole in the back. I don't know. It looks fun as shit. It looks fun as shit. The art is cool. It's very red, you know, very red and red, <laughs> red and yellow. It, it, the art looks awesome. The, the you know, uh, Samuel L. Jackson, John Travolta look badass. The sculpt of Samuel L. Jackson in the back, the cheeseburger, the case again you know with, with the gold in it uh, i don't is there a watch where's the watch the watch has to, is it a watch on the right i think that's the watch on the right the fucking topper is so cool it's them dancing the iconic scene uh in the movie where they're dancing you know what it is uh oh yeah and john travolta mold in the back as well i'm just watching the video over and over because it's, it's all we have uh the back glass back glass looks cool it, it all looks great um anyway that's all we have to see talk about it later just wanted to get it out there because the trailer just popped while i was recording this so pulp fiction pinball chicago gaming company coming soon oh oh, 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 prices maybe just quickly talk prices of this game uh as far as we know so far there is two models uh, an le right and an se the le will go in order the se is seven thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars aka eight thousand dollars the le is ninety five hundred the difference is, sorry, I haven't looked into it. Uh, you know, probably a topper and things like that. I don't know. Go check it out. Anyway, Pulp Fiction. Kale's in. Are you? Okay, so on the note of can't keep up with every pinball company known to man is releasing every game now, I won't lie. The one I'm most excited for is the one that we're going to talk a little more in depth today. And why not talk in depth with one of the creators of the game? Mr. Raymond Davidson. Well, yeah, with all the new game, another one, another new game just got revealed. Yeah, and I did that right before yours uh, came. Actually, uh, let's just start. Hey, welcome, because I, I just, I just played that trailer like on the podcast right before you joined. Um, so, I, well, hey, welcome, Raymond Davidson, aka Ray Day. Uh, did you see the Pulp Fiction trailer? Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, just saw it, just dropped. What do you think? looks pretty cool although um i yeah i mean i had it looks way better than the uh the potato phone pictures we saw before <laughs> when it's in full <laughs> full resolution 
But it, I, I guess it is the same layout of the potato pictures, though, right? I think. Yeah, but it looks so so good with the you know in high def. <laughs> right. Yeah. In real life, it, it actually yeah it looks awesome. Um, well, I, well, we can talk about Paul Fuchs in a bit, man. Thank you so much for joining. I, you helped make one of my favorite games of last year, if not my. No, I think it is my favorite game of last year, Rush. Uh, and now Ooh. you're on Foo Fighters, which I'm super pumped. Um, you're so forgive me. I am the worst knowledged pro circuit pinball. I don't know shit about <laughs> about pro stuff. So. It was what you just came back from Pin Masters, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was the uh, North American uh, Championships on Thursday, and then that weekend there was the uh, yeah the IFPA Pin Masters Championship, which is their their one big uh, pin golf tournament they do a year. And all these terms, I know IFPA, but everything else, are they all just pieces of that? larger ifpa puzzle or are they all like sanctioned if you will i give me the 101 i don't know anything about any of it i mean at the base level yes they're they'll, they will all be worth ifpa points um but these ones are uh particularly run uh by the ifpa so josh sharp zach sharp um you know adam becker they're the tournament directors for this tournament they set up the games they make the rules you know they run this these tournaments um, and they even give extra boosts for them so that they're worth a little more IFPA points than a tournament you and I would run. Um, you know, it has okay. some perks being in charge <laughs> of the IFPA. Yeah, right. All right. So, I mean, you started off, well, I mean, you started off before this as, as a human, <laughs> but, you know, a pro, if not number one pro, are you the number one right now? I can't keep up, man. I, I what's I've slipped all the way to fourth now after this weekend, oh, if you can believe terrible. that. Terrible. <laughs> man yeah, if you want me to well, hang up now i can yeah i can understand here? <laughs> so did that did it were you number one before that does, i mean i am assuming like every weekend every couple weeks that just shifts around uh yeah i mean it's uh it's really shaken up quite a bit this year because of the new rules for this year where tournaments can basically be worth double or triple what they were last year so oh. now it's like if you get fifth at a tournament and someone who is close to you gets first they just gained like a huge amount on you and so now they, they pass you and the only way to get it back is to beat them at a tournament whereas before you could kind of just grind out points um yeah. and because there was kind of a cap on the points i kind of just went to like a lot of things and did really well consistently and that mm-hmm. was enough to kind of put me in number one but now um with everyone going to all these tournaments and them being worth so many points, every tournament I don't win, somebody else is winning and they're getting just tons of points. And that's kind of what's been happening uh, this year. Wow. So do you you have to just constantly be on the road, traveling, flying, driving? What are you doing? All that? Yeah, I rarely have weekends uh, where I'm not traveling or or playing in a pinball tournament. Uh, But it's, it's fun because you get to see different parts of the country uh, you get to hang out with pinball people uh, and you get to, you know, kind of rank yourself against your own self of like, well, next tournament, I'll do better. Uh, yeah. and, and you get to see the results get put in, you know, in live time. And and uh, I got to say, it's pretty nice winning uh, some big bucks uh, at those tournaments, too, uh, when you when you do well enough. Um, just won a new in box Stern for winning ah. the Nationals. So oh, shit. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask, like, what is the drive? I mean, I get the competition thing, I, you know, I'm, a lot of people are competitive, so I get that, but is there, yeah, is it a monetary thing or is it just the competitive thing? Is it just the hot, I mean, why do you do it? I mean, I, it's a little bit of everything. Um, but it also, you kind of get in an, a flow with like the addictive quality of, of the tournaments where it's like, once I go to a tournament one year, it's almost just automatic, like, Oh, well, it's time to sign up for this tournament, book your flights. You're going to it again, you know, for, for next year. And throughout yeah. the years, I've just started adding more and more of those. And so now my calendar all of a sudden is like, Oh, wow. I'm going to Texas next week, you know, I'm going to wherever the week after that, it just, uh, it fills up really quick and you just kind of get addicted to it. And how long have you been doing it? Like consistently? The, the tournament uh, I mean I've been ranked ever since 
2008, I think, was like my first God. tournament. So, I'm, I mean, that's like, what, 14 years, 15 years? I can't even count. Uh, Do you but see t- any signs of slowing down? Um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I definitely have thought about like, well, I probably don't need to go to everything and maybe just pick and choose a few things, but I'm still finding myself like, well, yeah, I do want to pick that one. Yeah, that one was fun. Yeah. And like, yeah, I do want to go to that too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of how that's so, been going. That's how like, I mean, pinball start. I'm using quotes as no one can see, but it, I heard of, I heard this phrase Ray Day a lot, you know, when I started doing it, I don't know what the hell that is, you know, and then when, you know, I joined the TPN thing and then I saw that name in there and like, what is that Ray Day thing? What the hell is that? And then I put two and two together of the name like, oh yeah, it's short for Raymond Davidson. Um, and I knew you from, or when I first started hearing Ray Day was from, I think Led Zeppelin because you did software on that. And for those who don't know, yeah, that was, uh, yeah. Like, uh, was that your first at Stern? Well, that was the first one that I had uh, a lot of control over. It was basically 50 okay. 50 me and uh, Tim Sexton. Um, when I started Stern, the first games I actually did work on was actually the Keith game. So, uh, you know, I did a little tweaks in Jurassic Park and Iron Maiden just to get my feet, feet wet. Um, yeah. And my first big project was Avengers, where Keith. Um, cause they had that guy doing games like every year, it seemed poor Rick was just overwhelmed. So they were like, you know, Hey Raymond, we want you to help Rick, uh, get this game up going, get it off the ground. And so I did a lot of the early, you know, modes and framework and structure, but I basically was following Keith's crazy rule doc that I had to parse and, and sure. figure out and how to actually make it into code. Um, I didn't do too much of the actual coming up with those rules. I, I improvised here and there for things, you know, coming, coming up with the scores and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's kind of how I started. And then my next big project was Led Zeppelin, where it was me and Tim. Tim kind of laid out the big groundwork of the macro picture. And then I, and then basically gave me the freedom of like, well, yeah, we have some tour multiballs to do what you want there. We have the the Zeppelin multiball. Uh, we need a wizard mode. Um, I actually came up with like, well, how about a halfway there wizard mode too? And he's like, yeah, that sounds great. Go for it. And so I did basically, you know, just kept, doing stuff that felt good in, in Led Zeppelin. Um, and then Rush was kind of the same thing. Same kind of split. You and Tim? Yeah. And I, I was going to ask that. I mean, you kind of answered it a little bit, I think. When I when people see your name on like Pinside or as, you know, software, Raymond Davidson, does that mean you're doing like conceptual design of the rules or you're coding it into Java, C++? I don't know what the coding language is, whatever. Is it both or, or what does software mean for you when you're making on a game? Yeah, for me, it's it's mostly just actually typing up the code itself and making it happen uh, for the, the leads um, like Tim or Tanya on Foo Fighters. Their software lead is more all encompassing everything that isn't strictly laying out the play field like the designer's job kind of falls on the software develop like the lead software guy uh mm. girl because they you know they have to really kind of line everything up manage all the resources make sure there's speech in the game make sure that you know this is happening make sure that's happening make sure there's a cohesive flow with the rules and and you know the inserts get used and, and everything it's it's um but as my what i did was mostly you shrunk it down and focused on okay, this mode, make it actually exist, you know, write the code to make it happen. Um, not, that's not to say, I mean, the lead software guys do that too, but, uh, I was just focused on kind of the micro, um, coding and, and, and implementing things. And how did that start? Were you, you know, uh, were you working on homebrew stuff or did Stern reach out to you or did just naturally like get to know people and then, or, How'd that start? Uh, it was uh, Tim Sexton who reached out to me. He said that they needed uh, more software people. And I said, well, I just bought a house in Everett, Washington. Uh, <laughs> why don't you reach out in another year? Yeah. And sure enough, a year later, he, he was like, hey, we still would like a software person. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, well, 
you know, by this point I had somebody who was renting the house with me and I was like, well, I could probably find someone else to rent it out too. And mm. I was like, well, I could probably pull this off. Oh man, this is a big, big change. I don't yeah, know. No and, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and were but, you doing uh, software before that? Yeah. Yeah. I was programming. Um, it was at a, a startup uh, called Ripple, R-I-P-L. They have okay. a, like a social media content creation app. Uh, for businesses to make ads for Facebook or, or whatever. Um, and so I was doing Android and iOS programming for uh, mobile. Ah. Um, but uh, I, you know, I had, I actually had done some C plus plus in a job in the job before that, although not very much, but is that I what Stern's C- coded in? Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it's all like C plus plus. Okay. So um, that was kind of one of the big question marks but also all my data classes in in uh, at the UW were all C++. So okay. um, they liked that, it, you know, had the degree. I could do the stuff. Yeah, um, that helps. So they fl- they, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they flew me out and interviewed me. And it was kind of funny because it was really cool that they, they put me up in this hotel downtown. It was really nice. And like everyone was all happy to see me. And we were going through talking to everybody. And then it was like almost within 10 minutes, boom, here's the whiteboard, uh, write code to do this. And I was like, oh, oh, crap. This is <laughs> like a code interview. Uh, and, but luckily, I, I managed to get to, nice. to do enough. And, if then, uh, code it. Yeah. 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 So Use a couple for loops. Yep. Yep. And so then after that, you know, got to meet all, all the people and talk with people and it seemed like I was a good fit. And uh, then I moved out here. In May of 2020, so I drove across the country right when everything was closed down. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's kind of fun. So you're not a contractor; you're, you're a Stern employee, right? Like permanently? I don't know how that works. Uh, yeah, yeah, Stern full time Stern employee here in Elk Grove Village. Ah, um, yeah. Well, I guess you moved and you left your Tron back there, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I left a, a, pretty much all my games back there. Uh, sold a couple. Renting some out. Some of them are just chilling in the garage. Uh, still got to kind of clean that up, <laughs> figure out what to do. I only mentioned that because there's been a couple of people who've reached out to me about Tron since I've mentioned on the podcast that I was thinking of maybe picking yours up when someone was done renting. And then this morning I was texting like, hey, I might buy this other one. What do you think? And, and you're, like, you're like, oh, just do it. Mine's rented out again. I'm like, fuck it. So I bought it. Um, so it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm pumped. So anyone out there, you can stop reaching out with your super expensive Tron LEs. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to pay that much for a Tron. Did you get uh, the uh, the the Pro upgraded with all the all yeah. the fixins? It was just like what you described yours was. Mm-hmm. A little more expensive, but it's like it's got everything, and it's either weight or just you know they just never come up for sale. So I'm like, yeah, yeah whatever. I'll probably take a loss on the shipping, but I don't care. I want to play it. Um, you know, I like Tron. I love Daft Punk. Even you know from talking with Scott, I've only played Tron twice, and uh, every I love it. I, I don't know. I'm just excited. So um, yeah, anyone out there, stop emailing me about your Tron. I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so you left your Tron there. You drive out here. Now you're a permanent employee of Stern. Uh, your house is what just getting rented out by people and just take care of itself. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I fly out there every couple months to make sure things are okay and uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, sometimes crash local tournaments, and they're they're both happy to see me and also you know like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> <Aren't> you in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> well, I'm I'm kind of already asking you a ton of questions, anyways, but um, I'd like to get to know your balls. We're getting to know your balls. If you don't mind. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the <laughs> correct response <laughs> to that. Uh, I have a, you know, a list of questions. I, I rotate this stuff all the time, but uh, I, I want to talk to you about Foo Fighters, but so let's get this the semantics out of the way. Uh, I think I might know this question, but I don't, or the answer, I don't, but you tell me. Do you prefer uh, location play or home play? Um, I, it, I mean, it depends on the location. Um, yeah, I definitely true. love, I, de- I definitely love the fact that like when you're at a location, there's a goal of, of first get replays and second, put your name on the high score list. Um, yeah, yeah. And I bet you're doing that all the time. <laughs> I'll try to. Yeah. Score. And yeah, yeah. But when you're playing at home, the goal is more like, all right, how deep can I get into this game? 
Or yeah. maybe the, maybe there is no goal. Maybe you're just playing because you're bored and you want to flip some pinball. Yeah. Um, so it just kind of depends what I'm in the mood for. But um, I see behind yeah, you I mean, turtles I, and what is what's behind turtles? Mm. Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to make it out, but it's actually a Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Okay, I saw the orange. That's about yeah. Yeah. And since you are you and you play games pretty well, I'll say, uh, like, do you get, I, I get bored of games quick, not because I'm as good as you are, but I don't know. I just, whatever. Do you get bored of games or like you beat it first ball and then what? I mean, how does it feel to be like a number one ranked and own a game? Like how, how long do you, I mean, you know? most games, at least the ones that I would own uh, are pretty hard to actually get through all the stuff, even for me, uh, yeah. you know, Godzilla, even the, the final wizard mode in turtles is hard to get to Mando is, you know, there's you got to go through all the missions and everything uh, like all games t- today are, are pretty deep. Um, and you can always make the games harder too. If, if you find you're getting to them, uh, too often. Um, I don't, but also <laughs> it's kind of like, well, if I play a game and I, it takes a long time and I get to the wizard mode, it's like, yeah, all right, cool. I'm probably not going to press start again right away. But, you know, a week or two later, I might want to do that again. And it's fun to just have yeah. a game at your house that you can be like, all right, let's play, you know. Yeah. And <clears throat> since you work at Stern, and I w- I've never been there on, on location, but I, I assume there's games everywhere and you're doing pinball all day. It doesn't become like a chore to you where your hobby is now your job. So you get sick of it. You still like playing at home or is there like a balance? Uh, yeah, I mean, I am. I might be a little unique in that because I pretty much everything pinball, right? I work in pinball. Yeah. I, I take days off to go play in pinball tournaments. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I have pinball machines at my house. Uh, I've I sometimes go out to like Logan to play pinball there. Like I don't know, I just I love it. Uh, I don't really get sick of it. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so to take a very dark turn, do you have uh, a big fear in life you're willing to share? Uh, I don't really have any phobias, but you know. I'm always scared of uh, missing out on things, you know, like not uh, not being ambitious in something or not trying something because you're scared of it. And then it's like you find out 10 years later, like, oh, I should have done that. But now uh, I can't. <laughs> wow. No, I yeah, I I struggle with that, too. And I mean, sometimes it's yeah, I I get sometimes anxiety about flying, even though like. I still do it, but like every time I'll make up a reason that's not flying, like, oh, I don't want to go just because of like, I'll bullshit myself and say it's not the flying thing, even though it kind of is. But, um, and then I just force myself to do it. And like, yeah, to your point, if I didn't, I would totally regret it. But there's plenty of things I don't do because I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so pinball, back to, back to pinball. Do you have a favorite era of pinball? Because as a tournament player, you play all of them all the time. I got to imagine there's like a, chunk of time that you enjoy the most um yeah i mean it 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 depends but uh i do kind of like the 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 90s you know valley williams for competitive pinball because they're always kind of familiar in the fact that there's they didn't because a lot of times with the the newer games you'll see them pulling out lane posts or setting ball saves off or doing all these crazy settings to them. Yep. Um, but on the, the Williams Valley nineties, they, uh, they usually just don't touch them and the rules don't have adjustments. So it's always like, well, if I'm playing Adam's family, I know I just have to shoot the ramp and shoot the chair. I just have to shoot the bookcase, just get multi-ball. So there's something kind of cozy about sure. Playing those games in, in tournaments. Um, I feel like I have a lot of agency in that era uh, whereas the older games, they are simple, like the 90s games. So you know what to do, you know, like hit the target, shoot spinner. But they're a little more random and chaotic. And even when you hit what you want to hit, sometimes you don't get the ball back. So that's annoying. And mm. um, and then, like I said, the, the newer games, a lot of times uh, they'll just because the newer games are kind of designed with all this depth that we talked about earlier. Yep. It means they generally will play longer um, just geometrically or with the software features so they have to really kind of strip them down a little bit and and kind of nerf them for competitive play. And then that kind of turns those games into being a little more scary, a little more unfamiliar, unknown, you know. So mm-hmm. that's kind of my analysis on that. I know what you mean by comfort games. The My two biggest comfort games are Star Trek Pro specifically 
And, <laughs> yeah, uh, you haven't played the, the Star Trek at District 82. No, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Oh man, uh, they, 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 I didn't. They pulled posts I didn't even know you that existed. Like, yeah, whew. open lanes just ten <laughs> inches wide. But that's because that game can can take a long time. So. Yeah, and I think that's probably why it's a comfort one because I can kind of just play it and the ramps feel so good. Oh my god, those ramps! Those were I remember that was the first game that um I I got and the probably the pinball game I played before that was probably uh 15 years before that, uh, which was probably like either Waterworld or Attack from Mars at the bowling alley that I played a lot. So when I got into pinball and that was the first foray into like, oh, I'll buy a game. I had I don't think I'd ever played a modern Stern. So when I got it home, I was like, holy shit, what the hell is this? Uh, it was like, yeah, a that, that's that's one of the best Steve Ritchie flow games, like the layout where every shot just goes into another shot and it and it's buttery smooth. It just, you you kind of just ride those ramps, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like it just it just you feel it. You, you feel like you are the ball. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, do you, I don't know how much you do secondary market stuff, so I'm going to a slash here. Do you have any horror stories from the secondary market or I guess in your case tournaments since you're doing those? Well, I, I sold a uh, stranger things premium, uh, right Oof. when nobody wanted it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I basically, I traded it for a star Wars pro. That's Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a whoopsies. <laughs> yeah, at the time it made total sense. Yeah, yeah, you blew it. Um, well, I guess you know um, Gomez was on the free play podcast. It sounds like they're going to remake him anyway. So you know, maybe you'll uh, get to play him again for a lot more expensive than you had in the past. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a Star Wars Pro. Oof. You know, I actually I had a Star Wars pro for a little while and then i had a premium just recently um and i don't actually i do know what it is i kind of like star wars pro better than premium because of the the horseshoe on either side is always super fast because that ramp never comes up on Mm -hmm. on the pro uh and i kind of like that that it's so fast all the time where sometimes if the ramp is up and you hit the hoth shot like it just kind of stops and you have to wait for it to fall down and takes away some of the flow to me but um yeah that death star shot is kind of it's tough to hit too yeah can't backhand it that well. Sometimes, mm-hmm. maybe. I know Mister Many uh, vehemently disagrees. I I tried backhanding his. His doesn't backhand at his. I mean, it was super floaty um, when I played it, but <laughs> it's true. Um, well, yeah, I had one premium at home for a little while that I could backhand it, and I was I was like, oh my god, this is crazy. But that was back when I was too pussy for Star Wars, and I just was like, you know, it wasn't. <laughs> I was, but uh, okay. What is something you are grateful for? Uh, well, I, I guess it's kind of cheesy, but I'm grateful for my my job here at Stern. <laughs> yeah, because you know it lets me. Uh, they're they're cool about taking time to go to tournaments, and and it and it's just really cool to be able to work in pinball, so it doesn't feel like work because it's something you like doing. So I'm definitely grateful for for that. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. I, I had a feeling you could just say the word pinball and it would suffice for everything you do. So, you know? <laughs> yeah, mean, yeah, actually, yeah, it's very true because even my first software gig was kind of a networking through the guy who is the league president and the guy in charge of Seattle Pinball Organization. He His company needed an intern and he knew me from pinball. No shit. So it's, it's just crazy how, how much they kind of affected my life. Yeah. Uh, that, that's actually... Um, Man, that's cool. Uh, when you're playing a game, I want to hmm, knowing the games you've worked on. Yeah, I don't. I can't answer this for you. Uh, ramps or spinners? Uh, I think probably ramps, just because I like. Y- you get more like the spinner. You get the immediate satisfaction of like you know, and yeah. you see it spinning. But the ramps, you get the full like it goes up and around, and winds comes back to flipper, and then it sets up another. Another shot, whereas mm-hmm. a spinner, after you hit the spinner, you kind of got to wait and see what happens. And, you know, so if you could have a spinner on a ramp, which I know some games I think have, but I feel like not enough. Mm-hmm. That would not be... enough is totally the answer. Yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. I know for sure that the spinner on Rush is one of, if not my favorite spinners to hit. Follow. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, followed closely by the spinner in Star Trek, mainly because of that bright light under it. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, but man, when you hit that that rush, oh, it just. Oh yeah. Oh man. It goes and goes and goes and uh, oh man, it it feels good. It's opto, right? No friction. Yeah, and it's the right spot on the flipper to me. It just feels like I you can hit it every time you need to. At least from the can you back? Yeah, in? yeah, and it's got that cool Borg geometry where you hit it and it kind of slows the ball down a little bit and kind of just nicely pauses and then comes down in like this nice cadence where it's yes. like rip and down yeah. and flipper. Like Very it predictable. Just, yeah, every time. Which sometimes on the Jurassic Park splinter, which is another one of my favorites because it's a really good shot, uh, you know, it kind of sometimes gets a little clunky. But I did read he did that by design. Otherwise, it would be like you way wouldn't too go fast. in the pops. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, which I thought mine mine was jumping. Uh, one of my recent <laughs> Jurassic, I would hit the spinner and it would jump up in the air. Turned out that like back post was up a little too high. Oh, little, yeah. Yeah. So or, or even down too low and it actually jumps off the, the oh, wood insert. Sure. Yeah. Shit. I think it was do- <laughs> I got to change something. <laughs> um, all right. What is something, man, I think you have, I don't want to speak for you because pinball, 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 but is there something you want in life? Um, I, I would love to eventually, like I have a house in Everett, but right now it's, it's not, it doesn't have like the big kick-ass basement game room, mm. you know? Sure. It's pretty modest sized house. Um, and it doesn't mean I can't. Fi- I haven't filled it with pinball machines in right. whatever corners I could put them in. <laughs> but I think it would be great to have a, a house with a big old basement, uh, kind of like my parents' house. Actually, they they have a yeah. nice game room and 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 just have have my house be the place where people can come over to play pinball tournaments. Uh, I'd love to. Um, actually, right before COVID, I was starting to have pinball tournaments at my house. Um, but then no, not we, fair. Come over. I know. Would you join? I mean, would you get in the tournaments and just beat everyone? Uh, no, I, I wasn't playing in that. Oh, okay, no. that's what I was saying. No fair for like I'm not coming yeah, over. No, I, I. It was just fun to kind of organize and see everybody having fun on on games because if you ha- own a bunch of games, they're almost certainly probably not getting as much use as they could. So. Yeah running tournaments at your house uh, or just hangouts where people are just playing games, talking, having fun. Uh, what, what games did you leave behind uh, besides Tron? Uh, I got a Dirty Harry, a Family Guy, um, <laughs> that Star Wars Pro, <laughs> although <laughs> right. that's that's sold now, uh, so I don't yeah. have that anymore. But um, And then I have a Rush Pro, Led Zeppelin Pro. Uh, those ones I actually just shipped to my house um kind of like a as a keepsake it's like you know i worked on these games and i don't have enough space in my apartment here for everything so i think that's it now oh and and the tron of course Mm -hmm. um i did have things like walking dead metallica jurassic park um but a lot of them have been sold um usually what'll happen is i'll rent it out to someone and then they'll be like can we buy this from you and I'll be like, sure, but you're not getting the, the rental back. Like, right. You're going to pay market value for sure. <laughs> whatever. And they're like, yeah, sounds good. I'm like, pre- okay, well, if yeah. I don't have to go p- pick it up, uh, that's good for me because I'm over here. So yeah. the less trips I have to make, the better. Uh, oh, that reminds me. I guess I do have a Batman 66, but it, is, it has been on permanent loan since I moved here. Like th- they've rented it uh, every month for like two and a half years. It was and, like a couple hundred bucks a month, 300, 400. Uh, well, that one, I mean, I, I guess I don't blame them because I, they, they locked in at a really low price. It was all, only a hundred bucks a month. Oh yeah. But it's added up over two and a half years. I've yeah. Just, <laughs> Not bad. And I haven't had to do anything. So they've been th- taking care of it and, and everything. And, and, uh, at some point I'll get that back. Cause I really love a uh, Batman 66. It's a fun game. I do too. I really do. Do you have, <laughs> Can you answer this? Do you have a favorite game moment over the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of pinball you've played? Um, I really like uh, Lord of the Rings has a lot of great moments of uh, like just getting to the super jackpots in any of the three multi ball feels like a moment because you get Gandalf yelling super jackpot at you. Super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> defeat the Balrog, you know, and cross everybody on the bridge, and then that's yeah. You shall not pass. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's that, probably one, one of my favorites. And, I went and to someone's house the, the other day. Yeah. Oh, God. I, I went to someone's house the other day um, uh, who had two, two Lord of the Rings because he's a psychopath and he was, <laughs> I mean, a good one. He was like swapping <laughs> things between them. And I was like, oh, let me play this one. Uh, and while he was like doing some stuff, so I played his Lord of the Rings. And I got eight people across and I was on the ninth. And he came over and was like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, don't. You know, like I just needed that night. <laughs> like, get away. And then uh, I didn't get it. And he's like, oh, he's like, what happened? And I was like, oh, I, had, I had one ball left, brah. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, oh, yeah. Actually, that reminds me. Yeah. Lord of the Rings is the other game I have. That one's that one's at my house. Uh, good. It's actually it's actually in its own little room. It's like there's like a Lord of the Rings movie poster in that room uh, and like a TV with, uh, you know gaming consoles and stuff it's like the little media room yeah and uh, yeah lord of the rings i had to i bought one of those when one came up because that's uh, one you, of my favorites you have to yep i've i've almost always owned one i don't i've probably had six of them i'm stupid i um <laughs> I, i'll have another one at some point uh there's something i was gonna ask damn it well hey you know lord of the rings um you guys should remake it tell your boss and everyone like hey we'll remake it again so i don't have to buy it i'll buy a new one and then i'll just keep it um all right is there a game that you were surprised you liked? I don't even know if this is a good question for you because you've had, you've played every game in the world. But a game that you've heard like, oh, that's trash. And you played it like, no, I really like this game. I mean, you said Family Guy, honestly. When you said Family Guy, I was like, oh, what? Really? Uh, but yeah, is there a game to you that you're surprised you like? Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, <laughs> I, I have a Turtles now and I actually yeah. really like it. And I never thought I would like it. Uh, cause it was kind of always in competitions and it was always so brutal and I didn't understand, understand, you know, how to get points in it. And it was always just kind of kicking your ass and I was never really gave it the time of day, but now that I've played it a bunch, it's like, Oh, it's got some sweet, like it rewards you for getting those Mondo jackpots with the upper flipper and the super jackpot under the flipper. Like it's got, it's got good stuff in there and good moments. Um, so that, that was a vastly underrated game, um, until I, really sank my teeth into it i uh, i have a, I, I don't want to say a love hate with the game because it's almost like a hate hate with the game i love the theme <laughs> you know it's turtles but everything about it was just for me the reliance on the the middle ramp the left flipper i don't know what it is the geometry to me i just i'm so used to like the warp ramp you know mm-hmm. that type of feel or the rush where it just okay it always feels in the sweet spot or jurassic park and the tower yeah it's a little bit later on the turtles it's it's not quite in the yeah, i know what you mean it's but do you tricky, have it yeah. now down like for you do you can you hit it like consistently every time now uh i mean i i kind of fairly reliably but not every time now i mean it's it's always a chance that you'll miss it i mean probably only 50 percent accurate if i'm being honest but that's oh. you know that's still yeah yeah but for you with the warp ramp would you put up there more like 75 percent like, do you think I think easier? so, yeah. I think yeah. it's a little wider and a little more in the middle of the flipper, probably. Okay. Do you have a favorite game right now, overall? Like, what's the game that you're loving to play right now? I mean, my the usual answer to that is usually Simpsons Pinball Party. Jeez. Um, I used to play that Simpsons game. You ever played the Adams Family game with the with the hand that comes out of the box? That's a cool game. I bet that's a good. You got that game? You're like Simpsons. Oh. Yeah, I uh, I just struggle. I, I don't like this game. I, I'm sorry to all the pinball Simpsons fans out there. I'm not trying to rag on it to be cool. Like, oh, fuck Simpsons, I man. I think we just shit on this game. We did. We, we shit did. all over it. We shit all over one of the most You're popular. You're down a level because I don't think I've rated anything this low on my own. Because that's the game that I had owned because it was like my dream game. Yep. I finally got it. And I just played it so much. Like I played it like every day, all the time. I so, so much that eventually I, I had to just sell it because I had burned myself out on it because like, mm. I just played so many games on it. And then I actually ended up buying another one here uh, just like a year ago. And the same thing happened. I just played yeah. it too much. And eventually I'm like, all right, I got to sell it again. <laughs> uh, so now... Um, but but then it was cool. It was in the uh, Illinois State Finals. Uh, it was I got to pick it as my game seven. Nice. And I played it for like an hour and a half, and the tournament went to like four in the morning, and it felt it felt pretty good. And then the next day, I think that game was gone from that location. They're like, no more, no more Simpsons. <laughs> Just threw it in the trash. We can't be doing that. 
I, you reminded me of the a question I was going to ask uh, earlier. Have you gotten to Valinor? In Lord of oh, the uh, yeah. I think I've done it once on my game at home. God. And before that, I had done it once on location, uh, which the location game was pretty friendly. The slings weren't very live, you know, that sort of thing. Um, How does it feel? The, getting there does it feel pretty good it feels it feels it feels pretty good because that you have to you have to destroy the ring and if you don't now you have to play all the multi-balls again and it's kind of like that one precious moment of like all right this Mm. is it you know and it's the two ball right like it's dangling in the magnet knock it down yeah i don't know if that's it i don't know if that's the default setting but if it's not uh, you should change it yeah yeah right so correct me if I'm wrong, because I probably am. I haven't gotten to Valinor because, you know, I'm human. You have to get d- beat all three multi ball, uh, all three multi balls, get all the gifts from the elves and then destroy the ring. Is there anything else? Uh, you have to play all the ring modes and play there okay. and back again. So there and back again. OK, so you yeah, have to but beat on- all the ring modes. Well, I guess to get the gifts of the elves, you got to at least... Yeah, so honestly, be- beating each of the multiballs will get you a gift to the elves. So that's half of the gifts right there. Although sure. you actually need seven because you need six. And then after you get all six, if you get a seventh, you actually get a secret gift to the elf that you need, um, <sighs> which is pretty. Yeah, I won't spoil it. <laughs> I don't want to get one again. I, but <laughs> uh, the last time I had a Lord of the, <laughs> the last time I was like, I'm going to try this time. But it's such a grind. Oh, that it, it's a commitment. You're, you're signing up for an evening like like, yeah, you're <laughs> yeah, that, that's for sure. And if I got close, like to your point, if I get to the point where I'm like on that last shot and I don't make it, I'm going to throw a fit. I am going to throw a fit and whine and uh, damn it. <laughs> How about a least annoying or a most annoying moment in a game or so, so for me, for example, I don't like um, loop and supers because I, I used to love them in Ghostbusters, but then after a while, I'm just like, I just, I just want to, because you can't even drain it out. You have to hit it to start it. I'm like, Ugh. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I definitely don't like it when you're locked out of something or you accident, like uh, Congo, you accidentally start the satellite mode. Everyone loves that. It's like mm. bashing on those satellite targets. It basically turns everything off. Um, there's a couple of, yeah, a couple of moments like that. Like even even turtles, I get annoyed if I'm in a tournament and I just want to start turtle power and it falls down into that foot lane, and now I can't uh, start start turtle power because it's doing the one two three foot combo. Can you um, time it out? You can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's it's pretty, but it's still like I had it already. I just need to hit the shot, and now I, you know, it messes with you. Um, but uh, even then, like. I don't know. Other things that annoy me are games that like reset all your progress at the end of the ball where you uh oh like you know, you're one thing away and now all of a sudden none, n- nothing you did mattered or or actually like kiss kind of annoys me because the oh. way the playfield multiplier works is you know, every time you beat a song, you get another multiplier, but at the end of the ball, they all go away. So you could play just as good as someone else, but because they did it all in one ball, they have like 10 times your score. <laughs> and like, yeah. that's kind of annoying. That's my favorite thing about Jurassic Park, the newer Jurassic Park, is that aside from, you know, multi balls or whatever and wizard modes, even though they have a very, very generous uh, ball save, um, like, uh, the amount of progress you like, all right, you drained. Cool. You're still working on the rescues. You're still in the paddock. Mm-hmm. You're still like you can. Keep, and that for me, um, it, it's so disheartening in certain games where, yeah, the mode just ends. If the ball ends, you're just like, oh, that's done. Like Avengers or something like, oh, cool. Next. And no, no offense. <laughs> I guess you go to that game. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, for me, I, I like to. It seems like everything historically pinball is all all based on time. Hurry, 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 time, hurry up. And for me, sometimes I just want to chill. Even the Lord of the Rings mode, sometimes I think the timer is like too fast to where you suddenly hear Frodo, four. Yeah. Yeah, like, Shut up, dude. Shut chill up. Out. Yeah. No, yeah. I think that's done on purpose to make you try to drain, right? That's what they say. Yeah. You got you to gotta just yeah. ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, letting us get to know balls. Let's talk about Foo Fighters because, man, that is, is it out officially? March 4- 13th. I don't know. I've, you guys have been shipping them? I don't even know. 
location? Uh, they should they be getting out soon. I, I would think so, because they, they did all the gameplay streams. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they should be arriving people places soon. I put a deposit down to flipping out pinball for a premium. So I'm buying a premium um, day one. So I'm really excited for that. I know a bunch of bars are getting the pro around where I live. What? Uh, I mean, the design team was Jack, Tanyo, Zombie Yeti, you. Who am I missing? Or is that, is that the mains? Uh, I mean, that's the creative team i guess i would say so that's you pretty much i mean there's tons of people involved in uh sure making it actually happen you know mechanical engineers um and artists right. and everyone so what did you do in this game i know people haven't played it you know maybe that's a very loaded question but earlier you mentioned like uh sometimes you worked where someone kind of did the overall design and you got these little pieces to work on was it similar here uh, or, or what pieces of this code not people don't really know the reference because they haven't played much of it but what can you say that you worked on in this game specifically uh yeah i mean i basically it, like implemented the van modes uh the shot patterns and the scoring and then all the overlord multi-ball well tanya kind of set up the overlord mechanism with the you know the locking forks and and that's and the that big alien thing. dude up there yeah right up there yep yeah um, but I kind of did like the rules of like how many hits to start and, uh, the jackpot sequences and that sort of thing. Um, and then also just the, well, we all kind of collaborated on the rules of like how you build the FUBOT, like what you should do to get the different parts of the FUBOT. Um, but at the end of the day, like I was the one that actually, you know, put in all the code and, and implemented things, um, so I kind of, yeah, I basically just did all the, the rulesy stuff. Um, the, we actually had another person, Mike Kizovit, working, and he helped implement a lot of the light effects and speech callouts and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and then, of course, Tanya also putting in stuff like that and making the game rock. Um, so it was a very good collaborative uh, effort, for sure. And you said the van modes, are those like the main modes of the game? Is that like the progress towards wizard modes or? Yeah, so there's a couple different wizard modes. There's uh, the van modes, which are your main six modes. Um, you, you shoot the white arrow spell van like map on Jurassic Park. Nice. And then you shoot the van and you can choose which mode, which city to play. And all the all your cities carry their progress. Um, so if you drain out or time out and you restart it, you'll get to continue where you left off. Yeah, yay. Yeah. All right. Yep. Thank you. Uh, y- yep. Y- you do have to spell van again, but uh, luckily it doesn't get any harder to spell van until you actually complete a mode. And then it'll get a little bit harder and harder each time you complete a mode. Okay. Um, and then also before you start the mode, if you visit the the mod shop, which are the drop targets in the middle, yep. um, you hit those down and then you bash the paddle target behind it. There's like a big target um, behind the those drop targets. Is that like a layer? Yeah, exactly. Setup? Okay. And so you can bash that. Uh, as many times before time runs out and that will level up your van. So when you start a mode, if you have the, the bomb weapon thing on top of their awesome van, if you have that leveled up, you'll start with, you know, maybe six or seven shots already done for you. So it's like, you know, the mode's way easier to beat, or you could level up your speakers, which I think help with the scoring. Like you just get more points, uh, or the engine, which adds more time. So you get way more time to do the mode mm. so you can kind of either dive right into a mode but it's it might be kind of hard or you can level up your van and now it's it's kind of like a team ups on on deadpool oh um, nice and so that that whole all all those cities they progress towards two of the wizard modes which is austin which is a city that you can choose and that's a multi-ball wizard mode or dc once you so once you beat three cities completely, you can get Austin. And when you get all six, you get DC. Um, okay. And and you can, like I said, you can choose oh, yep. which cities to play and what order. So if you're like almost done with your third city, you probably want to go back, finish it so you can get Austin. Um, or you can pick another city because when you start Austin, the more modes that you've beaten on the first try... Uh, that'll boost your jackpot. So there's kind of like those little rules that I kind of put in um, to kind of help make it interesting. And so you're not just, you know, grinding modes to get to the wizard mode. There's actually 
you know, the van mods to think about. There's which modes I should play in which order. Yep. Um, and then the other kind of wizard mode in the game is the Fubot multiball, which you have so to that's, collect. Can I ask you when you're saying yeah. that? I'm looking at the play field right now. The the alien with the green head uh, is that the Overlord? Or is that just a in the main play field? Is that just a a minion dude? Uh, the Overlord. Uh, yeah. I mean, is that the Overlord in the middle of the play field? Is a guy with the green skull and the glasses on? Yes. And the, that's the overlord. So yeah. in his hand, he's got these schematics. That's the Fubot, right? And that's what you're saying. Yeah. People, you have to build. How do yep. you build that? So if you notice, the inserts are kind of arranged where there's like a head, a body, the arms and the legs. Yeah. And uh, basically the different game features. So like the overlord multiball, which is all bashing the dude with the captive ball, yeah. starting those multiballs. If you get like a super jackpot in the overlord multiball, you'll get the the head or or some actually i think the head might be area 51 uh because okay. dave Grohl is the head uh because nice. each each fubot part corresponds to a band member oh okay um as well uh and kind of vaguely associated with that area so like dave Grohl is on the right ramp so he's area 51 okay. um and so there's different things like uh for taylor he's the side ramp that's the combotron mode um and and when you do the band members feature, you'll actually get double scoring on that shot, that band member shot. So you can actually try to get Fubot parts and then combo them with the modes you want to get, you know, double shot values and things. Um, but uh, the double scoring would might go away at the end of the ball, but you'll get to keep your your body part. So if you just okay. get all six, that's the Fubot wizard mode. Ah, um, yeah. So, so it's been it's been fun trying to like. I want things that are fun, uh, but not impossible. Yeah. But I also want bonuses for people that go out of their way to do kind of the hard, hard stuff. I like that, you know, you get the main modes, right? The, the van mode stuff. And then this Fubot thing reminds me of, uh, what are they called in Iron Maiden? Uh, when you complete stuff, like, also it's, it's like, you know, gifts from the elves. Like, you actually do it, and then you get something. And then in Iron Maiden, the, what are they called in the right orbit? The, oh, uh, the Tomb Wars. Yeah, yeah, similar to that, yep. Right, you get these kind of, like, uh, uh, static things that, like as you said you might get the two times it'll go away but you'll still build towards this thing so there's mm-hmm. the main van modes there's the fubot and then there's I'm assuming, how many multiballs are there in here uh, there's the overlord multiballs so there's three of them so if you've played rush you know kind of how that works where each each time it's harder to start but you'll get uh, it'll be better and better multiballs um, so your first multiball on the overlord is only a couple of shots to lock the ball and then release it, but it's only a two ball multiball. Then the next time okay. you got to do a lot more shots, but it'll be a three ball multiball. And then the third one oh. is a four ball. And those are, I think all my life monkey wrench and the pretender. Yes. yes. Yep. And, and there's like all these, these, uh, story, they have a story to, uh, to them. So every time you advance towards the multiball, you can see on the screen, like, Oh, they're being chased by the Overlord. Like, oh, they got abducted by the Overlord. Like, oh, they yeah. now they're facing, now they're battling him. Um, or in the uh, the Pretender, the Overlord actually is like performing a concert at like pretending to be the Foo Fighters. I think I'm not. <laughs> nice. I'm not sure. You'll have to ask. Uh, there, there's a whole lore and and story to this that I I still haven't quite wrapped my head around. But because uh, they made the up game, like their so. own like TV show, right, or something. Yeah, yeah, it or, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it's like the Foo Fighters. Yeah, it's it's a whole thing. And so then the, the other multi ball is just what's that? Go ahead. I was gonna, uh, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. The other multi ball is the Area Fifty One. So that's shooting the right ramp um, on the premium. Uh, you gotta basically use the upper play field and hit the green targets, then shoot the inner loop, and then shoot the outer loop, and then hit the. There's like a diverter that op- opens up, and that diverter. Yep. Uh, re- reveals the the super jackpot target, um, which is how you start the multi ball. Okay. Um, but I made it so that on the premium, at least on default settings, every time you hit the right ramp, it'll kind of advance you. So even if, because I was finding you shoot the ramp and then you'd instantly drain on the upper play field and you're like, oh, now I got to go back up there again. Like, oh, sure. now I got to go back up. So now it's like every time you hit the ramp, it will advance you. But if you're good, you could just skip all the way through and start the multi ball right away with the upper pl- flipper. Um, and so then on the pro, doing, you just the the first shot to that right ramp. They could theoretically get to the multi ball 
with they could although it's shot. pretty hard that 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 upper flipper is is there's a big gap <laughs> uh okay. and it's pretty fast up there um All right. But you could, yeah. And whereas the the pro, it's always you know five shots to the right ramp uh, starts the multi ball, um, and okay. you can actually stack those. So if you play Overlord first, you can also bring in Area Fifty One. Oh, and have both of them going. Ah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. And I I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just gonna you you cannot backhand the right ramp, right? Nah. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, not from a trap. No, it's pretty steep. But right. I've seen balls fly up there, like you uh, save a ball and. Yeah. Flies up there from the right flipper. Oh, okay. Um, it looks like it's a very similar shot to like the Jurassic Park right ramp. Does it feel pretty good? Yeah, kind of. Ramp? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of that, or the rush right ramp even. Ah, yep, yep. All right, so you have done these awesome. I don't know if it's in response to Joel, but these babies first, you know, rules videos online of Rush and Led Zeppelin. I think AIQ as well. Um. And I, you, you might do it on, on this as well. For those who don't know, you, you basically simplify the rules as much as you can into like a five-minute video or it might be even shorter. And, and they're really awesome. Would you mind, no one's really playing this yet. Maybe they are by the time they hear this. People are going to start getting these like now. You don't have to go into a five-minute, but what should someone who just walks up to this and play it, what would your suggestion be of like when you start playing Foo Fires for the first time, do this and you'll have fun? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, spell van. So hit some white shots, uh, get your overlord ball locked. So hit the overlord targets and then lock it in the, in the overlord mech, uh, start your van mode and then bash the overlord. And now you've got the, the mode and the multi ball, always a winning combination. Um, oh, also when you skill shot at the beginning of your ball, uh, plunge with intent because there's so many different options. And it kind of depends on the state of your game. So if you want your van mods, you can actually plunge into the drop targets. And, and depending on when you hit it, it will actually instantly give you uh, one of the mods. Ah, so if you, like find that. That, you fi- if you find that the modes are taking too long and there's too many shots, at the beginning of your ball, if you plunge into the, the bomb upgrade, uh, now uh, you've just made it two or three less shots for you the next time you start a mode. You can also plunge super short into that little side lane on the right with the rockometer, uh, which is how you get your playfield multiplier. So you can kind of help advance that if you want that. You can also full plunge and it goes up the side ramp and then you can shoot the. Um, oh, does it really? It goes all the way up the side ramp. Yeah, yeah. It kind of that's that's how uh, Jack made it so that when you full plunge, it goes up that side ramp. So now you can hit the left uh, crossover shot, which then kind of jumps across up around the horseshoe thing to the upper flipper. And now you can hit the side ramp again and it's like a six way combo. So every time you do it, you get more and more hands clapping uh, and you get more and more skill shot points. Um, And then of course there's also the secret skill shots, which are the left in lane, left out lane. Um, And I think there's another skill shot too, probably the, the like targets on the left. If you hit those. And okay, good. So yeah, start a mode, get a multi ball. And can you stack, I know how you said you can stack Overlord and Area 51. Can you stack Mode, Overlord, and Area 51? Yeah, yep. So ah. start your mode. for. You can only start a mode if you're not in a multi-ball. So you always okay. got to do that first. Okay. Uh, then then you can do Overlord, and then you can do Area 51. Uh, or if you start Area 51, you now you can't do Overlord, but you can do a mode and Area 51. Um Okay. Yeah, and but meanwhile, also another advice I have for this game is just keep hitting combos because those things get juicy and give you a lot of points. Yeah. Um, every every shot you hit will actually light little combo tron inserts, and they'll keep changing in color the the more and more you hit them, and you want to try to get them to red. That's like the highest level. And so once those things, if you get those to red, is that that circle thing underneath? The yeah, the little circle lights. Okay. Um, yeah, if you get those to red, now you're getting probably like million combos, um, depending on on kind of how many you hit and which ones you hit. Um, and so those points can add up quick. So don't be, you know, once you're in a combo, just keep comboing out and you'll probably just rack up the points. Uh, even if like a mode shot isn't lit there, it's worth just hitting things. Uh, kind of like on Deadpool with the how every shot has the weapons. Yeah. Um, so you want to just keep keep ripping shots for sure. 
And last question I have, and this is probably in the rules or blah, whatever, but those lane shots, like the shats, targets, I don't know else to, what else to call them, you know what I mean, by the slings, what do those do? Those stand uh, They are a uh, shot multiplier. So if you hit that target for about five seconds, you'll have double scoring. Um, for one and, shot or total? No, it's, it's just a timed thing. So if you hit a couple shots within the five seconds, they'll all be multiplied. Um, it's just a really, it's a burst of, of double scoring, but it can also be on top of the play field multiplier, which you get by shooting the right orbit and building up your rockometer, um, which can go to two X or three X. So then mm. if you have that running and you use the ray gun, you know, now you can get four X or six X for, for a couple seconds. So, um, it's fun because it provides some really good bursts of points and you can kind of risk, like, do I want to try to shoot this? Um, cause I have my super jackpot lit. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. All right. I guess I lied. I have one last question. What's your favorite shot in the game? Ooh, uh, I mean, I, it's hard to go wrong with that left crossover. That thing is so cool. It's like the Katana shot where it goes left and then right and up around to your upper flipper. But my favorite shot sequence is just going center spinner, side ramp, center spinner, side ramp. Oh, I, I could yeah. do that all day because that, yeah. that side ramp feels so good. And it's. It's very friendly. It's like the the opposite of the turtle side ramp. Like you, it, the wait. ball just sucks sucks it up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man. Okay. Let's leave it at that. I'm excited. Let's let's let everyone else wait and, and go play this thing. Man, thanks for joining me. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk Foo Fighters and, and honestly get very personal with some of those those questions. And I really appreciate it. And honestly, you're one of my the favorite things about being in the TPN Discord. The the comments you have. The I mean even. For those who don't know, when people are talking, call it smack or whatever, or giving feedback about, let's say, rush rules or whatever you want to call it, you're listening and you're actually, from from what I see, like you're caring. You're like, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I I mean, it's really nice to see, to hear, to like be around your positive pinball stuff. You seem to just <laughs> Thanks. Be yeah. I mean, I can't, you can't cater to everyone's opinions or wishes, but you can kind of aggregate the feedback and... And yeah, just kind of check the pulse on things. And, you know, especially if it's something you worked really hard on and then people are like not seeing the work you put in, you're like, well, (laughs) it's there. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And you have a good, you know, uh, what you're trying to do is like, oh, no, it's there. Just let me help you get there as opposed to like. You could take the other approach and tell people to F off, but I assume the same with this <laughs> game. You know, when this game comes out, I'm sure you'll do tweaks and updates and you'll probably be open to feedback and all that. But this thing just looks like a home run out of the box. So congrats uh, on all the hard work. I'm glad it's shipping. Um, you know, uh, are you working on stuff soon? Are you going to be back to work doing other games? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm working on Foo Fighters, you know, till it's oh, right. <laughs> 1.0 and beyond. Well, thanks again for joining. Uh, have a good night. Um, Best of luck to you on, on your future coding stuff at Stern. All right. And tournament. Thanks, man. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, Ray Day, for joining. That was awesome. Thanks for all the news on Foo Fighters. It was great to hear more about competitive p- play because I don't know shit. That's all I have this week at the Pinball Party. You know, you should really listen to the latest free play on the Pinball Network uh, with Amanda and George Gomez awesome information pay attention listen to what he's saying you might hear some stuff some games maybe one that's really hard to find maybe it's going to be remade i don't know listen to it awesome interview she does a ton of prep it was something to learn from Uh, in fact i did a little more prep this time with ray day (laughs) than i would have normally so thanks amanda for setting the bar also, I know Gomez mentioned they're working on channel sales-ish, or that strategy. If you're out there for listening, I myself work in channel sales. Would love to help out if I can. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Let me know. Happy to talk. Anyway, I think we're going to have a flipping out with friends. I think I'll be on there this week. Um, Wednesday. This, this, Yeah, this Wednesday. Yeah, Myself. I think Doc Monday is going to be there. Don't hold me to it, but I'm pretty sure. I'm uh, not sure what else is going to be released this week on the Pinball Network. I <laughs> Do I have the last three episodes on here? God, i got to stop. Uh, next week, I think we'll have some JJP info on the Pinball Party. I'm going on site this week. Thank you, Ken, for the invite. 
I'm going to go play some of your godfathers, shoot them shits for a while, give my thoughts when I come back. Until next time, feel free to help the show out on the Patreon, the Pinball Party Patreon, or send me an email, pinballpartypodcast at gmail.com. Specifically, if you have any horror stories of the secondary market, I want to see these. I want an influx of these. I want way too many. I would love to read them. That's some of my favorite shit to hear from. Uh, so we can empathize. We can feel sorry for you. We can say, wow, that's fucked up. And maybe we can start making awards for the most fucked up secondary market stories. Anyways, email in. Listen next week. We'll see you later. Bye. I don't want to be dead wrong. I'm better than streetwise degenerates in my mind. I don't know.